Welcome everyone. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending where you might be in the world. Thank you so much for joining us. So without any further ado, for those of you that are risk assessing schedules and uh, determining a P80, P90 date, how good a date is it? And it's only as good as the risks that you're modeling. So it turns out that we have a gaping hole. We've been having a gaping hole for the last 50 years. We'd like to cover that up. This is what this presentation is about today. Here is a um, uh, uncovering the theme of this presentation. So, you know, for those schedulers, most of the audience today, we know how to use float. We use it in a conventional schedule, but we're not ever using it at all when we risk assess the schedule. That's kind of a economy that we haven't thought about until, you know, a few years back. And I want to be able to catch you up, introduce the subject, get you excited about it, and perhaps you, you play with it and, and see what you think of it. So it's all about how to model the risk of using float when you simulate a schedule, okay? All right, um, let me move on. So when the thing about uh, simulating a schedule is we're trying to establish a contingency for my base case schedule. If I have a completion a schedule of 500 working days, how much contingency should I have to uh, to basically absorb any delays which are likely to happen? We tend to be optimistic about life in general, and that includes schedules. So we need some contingency. Well, back in the olden days, we would just say, "How about 10 percent, 15 percent?" We still do that to the many of us. But starting in the 80s and 90s, people said, well, I have to have a more objective way to do that. And of course, AACE is a professional organization that prides itself in putting out standards of practice. And of course, they do have schedule risk assessment cover. And these are the two main protocols, which I'm sure most of us are familiar with. And here I'm, I'm pulling out a statement. Why are we doing this? We want to estimate contingency and we want to understand the behavior of the project when we consider risk. So that's what this is all about. How does the schedule, what happens to my projected completion date aside model risk? Well, it turns out we have not been doing too well. Here's a study from KPMG, albeit five years uh, prior, but still fairly relevant. What they found is that only one in 10 public sector projects did not fall behind more than 10% beyond schedule. Uh, you know, it's, it's pretty staggering. Uh, Three quarters of the project, excuse me, finished more than 10% behind schedule. But you know, um, this is not the first time that this has been studied. Uh, there's a 2010 study that found similar striking unhappy results. So this is definitely a pattern still here. And of course, the Project Management Institute uh, publishes a plethora of treatises, and one of them is, relates to cost and schedule performance surveys. And here's one in 2016, and actually it tracks five years running. And as you can see, in this five-year window, half of the projects completed on time, of course, the other half did not. Now, maybe that's that is one hell of a betting average in baseball, not so good on project management. 
I think we all aspire to do better than that. And in 2018, <coughs> barely a couple of years ago, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they have another study. And uh, interestingly, in this case, they separated what they call high maturity projects, you know, a seasoned project management team from low maturity projects. And what they found is uh, the projects where the team was a little challenged, two thirds finished behind schedule. That's pretty staggering. But even in projects with a good uh, project management team, high maturity in project management, a third of those projects finished behind schedule. Again, you know, this is sort of a, uh, a, a pattern that we need to overcome. And, and I think uh, there are many factors that go into it. You know, we tend to be optimists in life and in schedules and in cost estimates, but we need to have a right model, the right modeling algorithm, because if we have a flaw in our modeling algorithm, well, you know, um, anything else is just going to be it's going to compound everything else. So we, we want to fix that. Pad Weaver, um, like yours truly, been around nearly forever, probably longer than most of us in this uh, viewing audience been around. Uh, and, you know, kind of a frustrated chap here. Here's a two-pitch article. And he says, you know, we know what a good schedule looks like, but we hardly ever see one. <laughs> you know, that's kind of a uh, self-inflicted wound. And because of that, most projects finish late. In his mind, what we need is more training and more accreditation. Okay, that's, that's Pat's fix. Well, um, in fact, notwithstanding Pat's perspectives, I offered to you that even if you were to do everything perfectly, you built a schedule collaboratively, all the right people in the room, you kept the current, you followed it, you updated it. If you don't have a probability attached to your finish date, or if you don't know the likelihood of meeting your project completion, basically you're at the lunch. And so training accreditation, just not going to cut it. And uh, I have a book here, uh, Super Forecasting by Tetlock and Gartner, uh, you know, a compelling read. I am on my third read because I read a little too fast. And, uh, you know, uh, I read the, the book, the inside cover of the book. And right there and then I was convinced if I wanted to be a scheduler, which means I wanted to forecast completion, I have got to do it with probabilities. I have to simulate the schedule. And really, I should be doing periodically, not just once upon a time. So um, any scheduler in the future, if you want to be a super scheduler, you better model all your schedules with randomness in them and ascertain what is the likelihood of your project completion date. Is it changing? Why is it changing? If my PAD day has fallen behind by a month, how do I get it back? Which is very different from if my conventional schedule is falling behind two weeks, how do I get it back? Shoot, I just shortened the critical path. Not as easy in a, a stochastic schedule. Another great book. Mr. Pearl, right on the first page, he quotes Tetlock 
which is what caused me to read his book. If you want to make a prediction about the future, you should base it on hard data. Forget hunches and biases. Well, you know, if you go to a uh, interactive planning session with all the smart people on the project, people with responsibility to get their piece of the project done, what do we do? Well, you know, we're pretty experienced. We take a shot at how long for this concrete activity, excavate, form, rainforest, you know, rebar, pour, and, you know, we make a shot. We'll have about 20, 27, and 35 days. We have this, we have this mental history, but it's not backed up by hard data. Uh, so that's right there is a problem. And, the, you know, um, psychologists have documented on Osseum, the fact that we are humans are the eternal optimists, which is actually good. If we were not optimists, we wouldn't be here today. We'd still be in the savannah, you know, chasing mastodons. But because we're optimists, you know, we, we can make progress, we take chances, we learn from it, and we advance and evolve. So it's not all bad. Here's the thing. If you want to forecast a schedule, you must deal in probabilities. A conventional CVM schedule is just a model for you to study the randomness of your schedule. And you have to have an ambiguous time frame. You got to know that your P80, P70, P90 date is, is pretty much right on because you have all the material risks considered. So uh, what about probabilities? If I may go back to the KPMG study, they asked the question and they document the fact that about a third of the respondents to the survey said they do perform quantitative risk analyses to calculate contingencies, right? We started that way. And so now that we do that, well, how thoroughly are we doing that? Uh, in the survey, you know, they ask people to, to check on risks. They're considering a, a lot of the risks in the study were really uh, what we now refer to as risks emanating from uh, how you deliver your project. I'll leave off labeling this for just another second. And um, of course, you're not going to see modeling the risk of using float on the list. I mean, it's not, it's not even in their consciousness, you know, when, when they do the study. Neither uh, in, in KPMGs or the respondents to the survey. So let me then just uh, get a common understanding. Uh, as we sit here today, uh, pretty much every experienced seasoned schedule risk assessment consultant can spew out the three categories of risks. Now, let me start first with, if I may tongue in cheek, call the schedule cardinal risk, cardinal inherent. Every schedule is born with a cardinal risk. And what it is, is the uncertainty uh, in the duration of activities. If you, uh, and, and people refer to these as, uh, you know, we don't know that, we don't know the factors that activity durations are random, but we know they are. And if you happen to have, you know, schedule updates for 15 different projects that were similar, and you looked at an activity that was the same in all the updates of these 15 projects, you might find that, you know, the range of durations was, you know, 18 days to, to 29 days. But hell if you know, why? Because we don't bother to 
get intelligence into our historical durations. We just don't do that yet. So um, that's your underlying risk of any schedule. When Richard Van Slyke in 1963 uh, conceived the idea of Monte Carlo modeling a schedule, that's what he dealt with. When the PERT people in 1957 developed the PERT system, that's all they were thinking about. And we were merrily along for nearly 30 some years before we said, wait, there are other risks. There are project specific risks, which not, don't affect every project. And they have a non-random distribution. You know, I have site conditions risks. How, who knows, maybe I start to excavate and this archeological find nobody knew about, everything's gotta stop. You gotta let the scientists with a toothbrush come in and try to figure out how to excavate the material. Well, obviously, you know, we gotta, we gotta think about the risk of that happening, depending if you're in Arizona, probably a lot higher than if you are, you know, in, 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 in Michigan, Southeast Michigan, the weather, uh, fabrication deliveries, you know, did you get a very competitive equipment delivery and maybe the vendor is a little suspect. So will he deliver on time and so on? Uh, these are soon to occur, not all the time and the impact activities accordingly. We have been modeling this risk really from the 1980s on steadily. John Holman, the last 10 years said that, wait a minute, there are other risks that affect the entire project. These are risks that emanate from the delivery of the project. And the classic example, again, is the maturity of the project management team. So if we have an inexperienced owner who perhaps awards a design contract to his next door neighbor, whether or not that firm you know, with the most qualified firm through a competitive procurement process. Well, you know, there may be some risk associated with that that permeates the whole project. Maybe, maybe you're uh, adventurous about new process technology because that's the purpose of the project. Well, you know, the risk associated with that and so on and so on. So normally we have a history we have regression analysis. We have a parametric modeling. Uh, however, uh, I don't know, about three, four years back, uh, we started thinking about, you know, we'll Monte Carlo model that too. And um, this case is the name of the famous risk analyst that uh, uh, proposed that a couple of two, three years ago. Um, so it'll come to me, I'm sure. Uh, these risks occur all the time and we have a range of impact. So to recap, we've got inherent risk and the duration of the activity. We have project specific risks and then systemic risk, pervasive risks. Okay, so I'm here to make you aware of a risk that we're ignoring at our own peril. Let me get, let me let a little background. Who stole my float? This is a software vendor. Bottom line is when float is consumed, the whole criticality project is enhanced. I mean, obviously. And we're not analyzing that. I mean, when we simulate a schedule, we are not modeling the consumption of float. Yet, float is there to be used. I can guarantee that in the millions of projects, schedules, uh, modeled over the last 70 years, not one was ever 100% down on the early schedule. So we're using float. Of course, it's there to be used. Pat Weaver, I talked about the Australian peer, any reduction in float increases the risk. Here's the deal. If you have a CPM schedule, a deterministic schedule, and you have 40 days of total float or an activity, and you use 20, and you ask the scheduler, what is the risk of 
right in the schedule. Zippo. I have 20 days of total flow left. Wrong. The risk of the project uh, being overrun has not been altered. Uh, so uh, to, to, to advance this thought, in a deterministic schedule, if you delay an activity within total flow, the impact on your deterministic completion is zero. That's not the question, though. When you look at your schedule stochastically, the question is, if I use 20 days out of 40 days total flow, is my P80 the same? Because when I went before the board of directors, I sold them on a P80 day. And if I have some delays throughout my schedule within total flow, but my P80 day that used to be October 1st, it's not November 15th, well, that's not so good. Maybe I need to change my schedule to get the P80 back to where it was. Well, we just don't do that, zero. They're in a single schedule in the world today doing that. Perhaps a few in PMA, that may be about it. And it, the, litany, the litany of people saying, hey, we don't, keep, we don't stick to the early dates. We might just not make it on time. Somebody else, we used to float. We're increasing the risk of overrunning the schedule. And of course, costing us more money. And it just goes on, you know, in other words, by the way, this is a 1997 article. We're asking ourselves the question, hey, we are overlooking this, but you know what? We're doing crap about it. Of course, it's not that easy. Maybe that explains why. And this is, to me, the bottom line. The use of float is not considered a factor in influencing the project duration distribution in schedule risk assessment. It's not considered. By the way, this is like, again, this is like in the 90s. So now we expand the taxonomy of risks we have the cardinal risk, the inherent risk that schedules are born with, project specific, systemic, and now we're adding a new category, speculative. And probably the, the arch classic, all important risk is using total flow and the simulation, which is an expiring resource or maybe want to slow down or accelerating activities. How does that impact my distribution, project duration distribution? A lot of examples, uh, you know, if you may keep up with the slide. And, you know, um, if I may, when you, at the beginning of the project, on your deterministic schedule, Every activity has your base case total flow. Uh, first month goes by, you have an update. Second month goes by, you have another update. At that point in time, I want you to think about the fact that that is the then existing total flow. And not going to be what it was in the base case. The beauty of the modeling that we do with our algorithms in our software is we know what the then assistant total float is at any point in time in an iteration. And that's what you need to have to have a, a objective reliable algorithm. You know, interestingly, we model float in deterministic schedules. This is the classic example. If we load a schedule with resources, cost, concrete cubic yards, tons of rebar, 
thousands of cable, you name it. We can, if every activity is on the early days, zero use of total flow, we get this green curve, which is your earliest rate of progress. In this particular case, if we let every activity use up their total floats, we get a different distribution. We get the red, the red curve, the pessimistic case. And of course, if we were to do randomly uh, model the use of float, then, yeah, we get a curve somewhere in between. So, uh, you know, it, it, I'd be the first one to admit that I was scheduled like the rest of you for 1969 on professionally doing simulations. My whole thesis was on scheduled simulation and my PhD thesis. I never thought about modeling float use. So I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not uh, picking on anyone. I'm picking on every one of us. And we haven't thought about it, but you know what? There's a time for everything. That's what we are now. So if this is the conventional case, if I look at, at a risk assessed result, a Monte Carlo model schedule, a risk analysis, a risk assessed schedule, I get only one curve. So we're fixing now. And our hope, my hope is that those of you with us today, that you go back, experiment with this. See how it strikes you. Which curve is it? Is it the early curve, somewhere in between, the late curve? Well, needless to say, it's the early curve. So once again, our risk assessments are giving us an optimistic outcome. If you want to be a schedule forecaster, you got to use probabilities. You have to have a well-validated statistical algorithm. Uh, Mr. Like Mr. Gartner. Well, the thing about CPM, though, the CPM algorithm is incapable of modeling the use of total float in risk assessment and schedule simulation. Can be done. Uh, now, mind you, when CPM was devised, invented in 1957, that was the furthest thing from their mind. Uh, probability of the schedule, but even the per people in 1958, they were not thinking about that. And you know, the basic scheduling model was for a deterministic scenario. So their models were perfect. We took those algorithms and used them in schedule simulation, not knowing that in doing so, uh, we needed to upgrade the algorithms and we did that for 50 some years before we realized shoot we have uh, we have to start from a better position so given the cpm can't do it uh fortunately for us you know we are also gpm schedulers planets and schedulers and it would be beyond the scope of this presentation to talk about the graphical path method or GPM, but Mr. Mather spent uh, near an hour or so before I came on introducing the software that implements GPM. So, uh, and I'm sure there is a large percentage in the audience of the audience that are using GPM, are using that point. But let me just give you the the, the fundamental nuggets, the, the, the bullets. It's an intuitive graphical interface. GPM algorithms were developed for graphical interface. We didn't want this waterfall kind of look that non-schedulers choke on immediately to get turned off. 
So we want to have logic. And we did not want to have to push an F9 button to figure out what happened when we switch an activity or add an activity. We want an immediate impact because you're smarter on the consequences of how you change your schedule when you see the impact instantaneously. You just, it's, it's your brain, uh, both sides of your brain are able to be more effective. And we allow activities to float without losing their early schedule. On a CPM algorithm, if you want an activity to float within early and late days, you have to use a constraint. The moment we use a constraint, we lost the early schedule for that activity, period. Not in GPM. We can flow the activity between early and late dates. We still know what the early date was because we have what's called drift, which is the ability to float backwards. Uh, clearly, you don't have to be a CPM guru to actually come up to speed, understand what's going on, and certainly not uh, relevant to my presentation today, but a GPM schedule is data alive left of the data day. You know that a CPM schedule, as the data day moves on from end of May to end of June, middle of July, end of October, left of the data day, the schedule goes dead is inert. There's no as-built total floats. There is no actual critical paths. You know, a whole body of uh, knowledge has, has had to evolve to evaluate delay using critical path schedules because the updates have no total flows critical path list of the data date. GPM Every time the data they advances, we know what the actual flows are left of the data day, what the critical path then is, whether or not it's been changing from time to time, and so on. I think it's pretty cool stuff. Any forensic scheduler certainly takes advantage of that. And to reiterate the fourth statement, Activities may float, which means we can model that risk in schedule risk assessment. How do we model it? Well, I give you four techniques. First, when an activity turn has come to be simulated in an iteration and has to float, we could model it uniformly. Let's, let's figure out our percentage of total flow use using a uniform distribution, 45%. That's what we use. I mean, it's probably, a, you know, all, all things equal at this stage of the game. Uh, all of us are fairly immature when it comes to modeling the risk of flow use. We're just getting started. I don't know a whole lot more than any of you in the audience. Uh, or we could say you know, what I consider probably a smart rule. Let's pace the risk of using flow. Let's say during the ramp up phase of the project where logic really matters, let's use only free flow. When we get to the bulk phase of the project, from 20% to two thirds, how about we use half the total flow? How about we use three quarters? Every time an activity uses total flow, there's less for the activities behind it, right? Coming after them. So obviously um, you could you could have all kinds of rules. You could, uh, you, you get that. And then when we go back to the last third of the project where you actually logic matters again, you started to complete systems going into a testing and pre-operation startup commissioning. Perhaps you wanna revert back to free flow. Uh, here's a couple of you know ways to do it. A third would be you want to know you bound. I don't care how you want to model speculatively the use of flow. You do want to model 100% all the time. That gives you the pessimistic distribution. You want to do that. That's your boundary. 
or you could ask the software to only use safe flow. Um, that, that is a subject for another presentation. Uh, we have the algorithms to do that. It's going to be added to uh, net risk uh, before this year is out. I give you a couple of uh, references for those of you that would like to read up on it. Uh, we can't wait to try that out, see what kind of uh, uh, p-values we get as compared to an early distribution or late distribution. So if I use GPM algorithms, if I may, if I use net risk, the risk assessor schedule, we can get an early distribution. I call the optimistic curve. We can model the use of flow, risk it in some way, and we get a in-between project risk, completion risk, and then of course the pessimistic case. In this example, if I didn't know any better, if I was doing CPM risk assessment, and I went to the board of directors from P80 date, October 8th, but you know what? If you accept the fact that float will be used, UP80 day maybe it's only P50. I think that that's pretty threatening to your position. And if your project is really using a lot of total float, I mean, it is almost certain you're not going to make October 8th. Almost certain. 20% chance of making that day. Not so, not so good. And the bottom line is, it doesn't matter which date you want to go with because we, we all are consummate professionals. We, are, we, we do the best we can. But you've got to have the total picture before you make up your mind. This is the total picture. Now, so because we're going to have multiple curves, you know, we can't be talking about a P80 in, in a vacuum. We need to think about different p-values. I highly advise you read this 1956 article that was classified in 1956, but now is in the public domain. And Sherman Kent and other people said, you know, we want to talk about uh, probabilities to, to the lay person. You know, we want to be almost certain this is not going to happen or this is going to happen. We want to be about even, how do I relate that to a numerical number? And they sat down there, they came out with a, a model to correlate numerical probability values to how our mind thinks. And I think it's pretty uh, telling that we have been going with P80 most of the time, which means we're going for probable completion date. Well, uh, let me add that besides thinking about which p-value to land on based on how much float use you have, you're modeling, I want you to think about that if you're modeling a detailed schedule or a summary schedule, uh, maybe you have some latitude about that too. And uh, Mr. Kent's model, uh, you know, comes to our rescue. For those of you that are risk assessing detailed schedules, which I think may be few and far between, uh, this is what I would recommend, what we recommend. When I say a detailed schedule, I mean a multi-thousand activity with takes that, that work down to activities ranging five to 15 working days maybe twice that much on a mega project schedule, pretty much down to the crew level. And if we do not model the use of float, I am saying you got to go almost certain, 90% chance. You want a P90 day. If you model float use, we're good with P80 and so forth. Mind you, we're just getting started. This is how we view this today five, seven years from today, after hundreds of case studies and experience, we'll be a bit smarter about this. So this is just a, a proposal as we get started. Now, most of us 
simulate schedules using a summary schedule. How do we do this? The risk analyst condenses critical, near critical, otherwise high risk activities from the detailed schedule into summary activities and milestones. So in a summary schedule, if you have an activity, Terran House Foundation, one activity, it lasts six months, it might aggregate 125 detailed activities. And as you know, when you sum random variables, the distribution of the sum tends towards a normal curve because of the central limit theorem. They think about normal distributions, they're biased towards the mean, so you have less extremes on the pessimistic end. Because of that, we can take a lower p-value, whether we model float or not, et cetera. So notice that, you know, uh, if I may go back, 90, 80, 70, we're saying you can drop down 10 points if you're modeling a high-level schedule. Again, this is a proposal for consideration, and I can't wait till, you know, the articles are published uh, in the next five, seven years, and we know we become better about how to do this. So, you know, here would be another uh, example if, uh, if we want to pick a, a, probable, a probable completion date, modeling the risk of using float. Okay, so we pick a P75 date. Looks like about 10, 17 or so. And once we pick the P75 date, we ask ourselves, what is it in the optimistic case? P95, oh, that's pretty damn good. Uh, what is it in the pessimistic case? P40. Uh, maybe I don't like that. I don't know that I would want to go on a pessimistic case with anything less than even. If I if I wanted to be cautious, I would want to have a, a, a any kind of a date, at least got an even chance on the late schedule. So basically, in this case, if, if I want a 50% chance, I'm going to have to pick a schedule seven days later, and that's going to get me to a like a P82 or so probable date on the floated schedule. So this is what we've been up to today. Uh, I hope that I have been not going too fast and that I have motivated you to start trying this, publishing your experience, making us all smarter about how to use float when we risk assess schedule. Uh, for those of you that would like a bit of a deep dive, I have extensive references. Um, and, you know, I mean, being a PhD originally out of Michigan, you know, you're almost judged by how extensive your bibliography is at the end of your thesis by a product. So I guess I've never gotten over that. And... I mean, some pretty interesting reads, by the way, uh, on, on this list. And I'll spare you any further comments and leave it up to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Gee. Uh, I'm going to pull up the questions from the audience. Oh, okay. Share them on the screen, so I'll change the screen share for you. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. Uh, What kind of an audience do we have numbers? Uh, it's listing 91 live okay. audience members right now. Can you see the questions in the view? On the monitor? Yes. I'm not on the monitor yet. What do I need to do? Uh, do I need to exit? No, just a second. Do I need to exit out of the PowerPoint? No, you're fine. No, it's just taking me a second to load them. Okay. You're using some of my float, Brian. Yes. <laughs> do you see them now on the screen? No. It says in the slideshow, click to exit. Do I need to click to exit? Uh, so if you look over at the other monitor. Your your monitor? The Crowdcast monitor, not your presentation. 
Oh, oh, the Krakas monitor. Yeah. I want to click on, on that. You want to just like a left click? You don't oh, need to click anything. Yeah. It's just out of view. Let me, let me go ahead and dismiss a notice here. Okay. Uh, okay, so how do I enlarge this view? Um, can I enlarge? I can't. I can even. Let me see if I can get a little closer here. Okay. See if I can get my. Um, is there a way I can enlarge that? Uh, maybe not on your screen. I can help you read through them. Actually, the first one's kind of for me, anyways. Uh, we had a question in the chat that asked whether it was possible to choose selected activities to export to XER, uh, similar to how you can select activities to import from an XER. Uh, Tim already answered that. Uh, yes, you can do that. Um, but one of the things I wanted to call people's attention to is we created two on-demand sessions. One is the intro to net risk cost, the new cost risk analysis functionality. And the other session is exchanging information between NetPoint and Primavera, uh, Primavera P6. Both those are on the PMA Technologies Conference webpage. There are videos that you can watch uh, right now or whenever you're ready. I mean, don't go there now. Uh, so please stay here for the live content. But when you're done, you can go there and watch those um, whenever you're ready. And that will cover your question about XER files. OK, I got a real example question. Yes. Um, so let's see. Can you read that one? The one. Yeah, the real example. Yeah. OK, so. Um, Daryl Field, one of our project control specialists in Detroit, um, we had a we were doing a uh, risk assessment training for all of our risk assessment professionals back four or five years ago. We're going through the room. Last question, Daryl Field says, you know, I'm a risk schedule assessor. I do it all the time. But one of the problems I have is we're not modeling the use of float. And people say, well, what do you mean? Let me give an example. I have a project, I'm putting out schedules every month, and all of a sudden I get an email from my electric from the electrical subcontractor. I'm working for the owner, I'm running the schedule uh, for the project, directed to do so for the contractor. And the scheduling subcontractor sent me an email and says, Hey Daryl, I got this cable tray activity coming up if a 40 uh, day duration. I got 45 days of total float. I have an emergency on another project. See you in eight weeks. And Daryl says, darn. Okay. So the electrical stuff comes back in six and a half weeks. And uh, he goes to, he walks the site. And because he wasn't there, other people occupy the, you know, overhead space. So his original shop drawing that had been approved no longer applies. He has to go back to his detailer now, and they have to reissue shop drawings. Well, guess what? The detailer is kind of busy, and he doesn't get to right away. And finally, he gets the drawings again, submitted and approved, which he didn't have it out on, his, on the schedule. Now he's got to fabricate it. Bottom line is, he came back with 50 days of total float for 45 duration activity, which is now 75 days. Bam, he blew it. So Daryl says, we're not modeling that risk. Every time you use total flow of an activity before it starts, you're assuming it's going to last a duration. But what if it doesn't? I hope that helps clarify the use of flow risk. Brian, can you read it? Yeah, I can. Um, so this is a question from Sergio. In the real world, how common do you think it might be that the deterministic P80 dates don't ever or don't even appear on the pessimistic curve? Uh, they would appear, yeah, well, I was going to say they would appear less than 10%, P, less below P10 most of the time. So less than than most, I mean, you know, 90 out of 100 deterministic schedules that we simulate the completion date of that schedule is less than P5. Uh, so, I mean, one chance out of 10, not even on the late curve. Okay. Can you read this one or would you like me to read it? Net risk, how many activities can it work with? Uh, this is for, uh, for schedule that are well detailed, would you retain the detail and range all activities, or would you bring the schedule to a higher level, and in doing so, or 
yeah, does it take away from the output? Uh, so again, first of all, you know, um, if you have a 3000 activity schedule that has been developed with all the key stakeholders signing off on it, and you don't have any loose ends and poor logic, all durations are, are correct. And let's say it's current. It reflects the history left of the day to day. Go for it. Well, that's not happening. So uh, if we start with a detailed schedule with all kinds of flaws, you just shot your wad. So what we do is we condense it to a summary schedule with the people in the room, with the right people in the room. We validate activities. We validate the logic. It's got 100 and 150 activities. We get it right. Then we can simulate it. We have a good base case. So uh, I would say that there is less than perfection in detail schedules today. So if you simulate that schedule, you're starting from the wrong base to begin with. Uh, however, if you use detailed schedules, have no bad logic, no loose ends, great durations, reflect history, let the day to day, go for it. Okay. Next question. How many activities can you work with? Is that it? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to have to defer that to someone else that is more knowledgeable about that. I mean, I, I it's not an issue how many. It's an issue of um, insofar as a reasonable runtime, how many. But uh, I don't have the answer. I'll have to owe you the answer. OK. Yeah, we'll have to get an ad response to that. I, I think um, someone actually commented on that. Let's see. I think Sevi did. Net risk best handles summary schedules, um, but you can run hundreds of activities, no problem. Once you get in a thousand simulations, will take a little bit longer. And that was Sevi's response to the question. Now he, I don't know. Yeah, he did. He commented on it. Yeah, he's, he's a developer, right? Yep. Uh, here's the next one. Yep. Considering project schedules need to be sold to owners, is that it? Yes. Oh, okay, so. Uh, the Veterans Administration, VA, about three, four years ago, it started to require contractors to, to risk assess their base case schedule, their baseline. The VA wanted to know, okay, so the contractor has a, a completion date. Well, let me back up a little bit. The baseline schedule from the contractor best complete early. If, if you have a 30-month uh, complete uh, project duration contractually and the schedule runs 30 days, you're done for. You're going to be 10, 15% late and try to blame it on somebody else, not you, of course. So first of all, you know, you want to have an early completion. The question is going to be, is that enough contingency? And if I'm the owner, I like to have the contractor. Not, I cannot really, you know, enforce means the methods on the contractor. If the contractor wants 10% contingency, more power to the contractor. But at least I know that if that yields a P45 date, I know that he has a, you know, he's starting from behind. And he's sort of looking for reasons I delayed the project, not, not themselves. So I think it's, you know, it's more of a full deck if you ask for that. And it's happening. As you see, I have to deal with things honor and E, et cetera. Right? Yes. Yep. Well, you know, I mean, that is, you know, that is a, that is a pretty good question. I mean, I love that question, actually. I didn't talk about that. So if you are modeling a uh, float for your entity, you might want to do one scenario where you only model activities that are your responsibility. On the other hand, since the designer is going to be reviewing shot drawings and maybe taking too much time, you know, one exercise would be you will simulate the schedule with only the design activities floating. And if they use the flow before you get to your activities, you would know how your completion has been impacted. Great question. See how we're learning so fast even just today. 
Uh, these are not other ways to use float I have thought about. Wonderful question. So next question in conducting risk assessment. Uh, yes, uh, we, you know, we can do integrated uh, min hour post schedule risk assessment. And you can have the answer for that. Absolutely. And last one, uh, please clarify when modeling risks using MCS Monte Carlo. Mm -hmm. What is the rest of the question, sir? Uh, it says zero float activities move the longest path on every MCS pass, whereas activities with high float may never alter the longest path. So don't today's risk software like Opera, uh, Old Pertmaster, and Safran inherently model float? No, they, yeah. So here's how it goes, OK? Um, if you look at an CPM uh, schedule risk assessment tool, every activity is happened on the early schedule, OK? Now, um, if an activity, um, you never, they never model the late schedule. So uh, in, in, in re the way the project, let's talk about a real project. How does it happen? Let's say you got 1,000 activities. You need first activity mobilization. You say it's going to be 15 days. It takes 15 days. The critical path takes 15 days. Your critical path goes through building A, and that's your critical path. Building B is not critical. Building B has got 20 days of total flow. However, the activities in building B are taking longer than you estimated, and at some point in time, building B goes negative total flow. It pushes the schedule completion. Building A, the original critical path, still shows now total flow. So the answer is no, it doesn't. It can't. In, in, in GPM simulation, when an activity, when the turn has come for an activity to be scheduled, uh, the, the algorithm says, okay, what is your current date? How much sort of flow do you have? Okay, well, let me use all of it. After I've done that, I say to myself, what is your sample duration? The total flow assumes you base case duration. Once you use it, you never know how long that's going to last. That's the breakthrough. OK, and last question. OK. For owners who have organizational cultures that haven't historically used risk or want to be optimistic, do you have tips on how to encourage them include risk and probabilities into their schedules, including uh, spending the management time to have the necessary meetings? Absolutely. If I'm an owner that I'm not interested in keeping up with my schedule probabilistically, at least I would want to know what is the likelihood that I, that contractor or I'm going to make the ending. I mean, it's better be 50% or maybe 80% uh, because that means I have enough contingency at the end of my schedule. So, you know what, I want to do a one off exercise. I want to know what the likelihood is. If it's 40%, that means you do not have enough contingency, which should force you to go back and crash the schedule. Your uh, base case scenario needs to be accelerated to create more contingency. You have a better start. If you at least do that, you're way ahead of the game. <laughs>